Mr. Hale, checked us out in the hospital last Thursday. A high heart rate, which didn't seem to be on an easy way to get out of the hospital. Yeah. I mean, little things here and there, but just, uh, yeah. She's not, she's not taking her medication. She's not getting the progress that she should be. All right, who is this? Gail. Gail. My son Gabe is, uh, is my youngest son is uh, uh, start, trying to launch his, his career after college at, in, uh, in marketing. So he has a marketing interview today uh, for an internship. So I'm excited okay. for that.
pray for Pastor Berkey as he's suffering through cancer, Lord, that you continue to strengthen him, continue to uphold him in your hands, uh, and continue to just be with him as he's going through treatments, and that you would bring him to full health and full recovery. Pray for John and Lisa, a prayer for Thanksgiving, Lord, uh, just keep lifting them up and just give them thanks that everything has gone smoothly, that or that everything has gone, everything has been done, and that you've been with them the whole time, you have not abandoned them, but that uh, these things have come to completion and everything is set in their house uh, to continue to live together in this new living situation, in this new part of life. So I pray for Carl, give you thanks that this is another year of his life, another year that we can celebrate the, the joy that Carl brings with him and his wisdom and experience and Pray that you continue to uphold him uh, throughout this coming year. Pray for Edgy as he's been down in Parkinson's boy, that you continue to be with him, that he would continue to have his eyes focused on you, be strengthened by you, uh, and that you be a testimony of faith, uh, just looking towards you and, and expressing gratitude in you despite the trials, despite the circumstances. Uh, we pray for Marianne uh, as she's been moving her mom into an assisted living. Facility and pray that that would go smoothly. That she would have the assurance that it's a good assisted living facility, that one that will take care of her, nourish and nurture uh, the mother, and, and one that they would just bring peace and comfort over her. The anxiety would melt away, and she know that she was doing the right thing and she was going forward in the right direction. Lord, but that she would have this assurance that it was through the Holy Spirit that you would place that peace upon her. I pray for. Gail, as she's entered into the hospital with a high heart rate word and that has all these other medical issues keep coming up, that you continue to be with her, that you continue to just, just strengthen her, continue to have her eyes looking towards you as all these tests are being run, as they find more things, as they are uncovering some more ill health stuff, uh, that you would continue to be with the doctors, that you'd be with her, that she would have peace, and that she would be able to leave the hospital quickly uh, as they give her clean bill of health. Pray for James. That he would have any fears or anxieties lifted from him as he goes forward to his marketing interview. That he would know that he is well prepared, well qualified, that if it is according to your will, if it is a good job, if it is a good fit, that he would get that job. The interview would be successful and there would be uh, just no issues with it. That he would be joyful as he starts this new career. Pray for Cindy. That she would continue to be strengthened, continue to be upheld. Uh, that she would continue to look for you, look through you, and seek you out, but also to strengthen and, and look for that self-strengthening, that, that perseverance, uh, and that you would be with her in that and uphold her in all this. Pray for Ingrid, as Ingrid is also battling with Parkinson's, that you would be with her, be with the family, uh, and that she would not give up, that she wouldn't, that she would take medication, but that the doctors would find the right path forward, the right treatments forward, as she continues to uh, live out this battle in life. I pray for Jack as he's been suffering with cancer, Lord, that he would be with him as the doctors would be able to find the right treatments, but also that you would just put your hand over that situation and rest your presence upon him, rest your presence upon that family, and lift them up, and sustain them, and uphold them. Uh, I pray for the St. Paul community. Uh, Lord, we pray over the St. Paul community as we come into this month of May that it will be a busy time, but also a time of faith filled uh, learning, faith filled. Uh, growing and that they would just the parents, the students, the teachers, the faculty, all people would be strengthened in these last, this last month to uh, just live out and do their work with joy in their hearts and with an energy that you have given them, uh, and that there would just be a great explosion of faith coming into and being poured out into these children this coming month and their families. We pray this and whatever else in our hearts and our minds, Lord, we lift them up and place them at the foot of the cross. We pray this all in Jesus' most holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. All right. So we got a few things to recap, but then we'll move forward into chapter 43, verse 26, is where we left off. So 42, just as the recap, like I said. 42, we covered. 42 is the 10 brothers go to Egypt. The famine in the land, they decide, hey, we gotta go to Egypt because that's where the food is. Let's go to Egypt. 
Joseph was in charge of selling the grain. Joseph was in charge of everything. And so, Joseph was brothers there. Uh, after a long, long time, finally Joseph sees his brothers again, but they don't recognize him. So, immediately, Paul sets the stage. I always think very important to mention that it was ten brothers. What did it with the eleven? Was Joseph's concern. Where was Benjamin? Did they kill Benjamin on the way here? Well, what's going on with that? Immediately suspicious. So that's why he sets about testing them. Kind of sets the stage. Because we think about it like, well, we know where Benjamin is, but Joseph has no idea. So of course it's going to be a little bit suspicious. So we go forward with that. Well, ten brothers, they get to Egypt. Joseph accuses them of being spies. They say, no, no, we're not spies. He says, all right, fine, prove to me. Go get your, other, your younger brother, and I'll keep one of your brothers here and ransom keeps Simeon, not Reuben, because Reuben admitted that he had no guilt in this situation, that he had no guilt in putting Joseph in slavery. He was saying that, hey, brothers, don't do anything wrong, Joseph. And they all said, nope, we're going to do it anyway. Sent him, sold him to slavery. So he keeps Simeon as his prisoner. They go back Jacob doesn't want to send Benjamin to get Simeon to, to save Simeon, so just wants to, he says, oh, well, I guess I lost two sons. Uh, so I lost Joseph and I lost Simeon. Dad wasn't planning on sending Simeon. But, we get to chapter 43, and the family was still bad. So finally, Jacob has to relent. He does give, um, he gives permission, they take Benjamin, and they go on their merry way. And that's where they get to. They get to the house of Joseph. Joseph sees that they bring Benjamin, and he's celebrating. They're going to have a big old feast. Um, the brothers are not realizing that they're going to have a feast of celebration. They are concerned that it's going to be a, uh, that they're going to be forced into slavery themselves because they have this concern about the money, because it's on the back of the sacks. But luckily, he was just happy to see Benjamin, so they had nothing to worry about. And that's what kind of turns out to write about where we were. We were about to get to the banquet part, which is verse 26. So, we we'll on the same page. We all recapped up previously on Genesis. Right. This week on Genesis, we were cool. Bad sitcom joke, anyway. So, verse 26. When Joseph came home, they brought into the house to him the presents they had with them, and bowed down to him to the ground. And he inquired about their welfare, and said, Is your father well? The old man of whom you spoke, is he still alive? They said, Your servant, our father, is well. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads and prostrated themselves. And he looked up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? God be gracious to you, my son. Then Joseph hurried out, for his compassion grew warm for his brother, and saw a place to weep. And he entered his chamber and wept there. Then he washed his face and came out. And controlling himself, he said, Serve the food. They served him by himself and then by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews, for that was an abomination to the Egyptians. And they sat before him, the first born according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked at one another in amazement. Portions were taken to them from Joseph's table, but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs. And they drank and were merry with him. This is a scripture my older siblings use against me. They always say I'm spoiled. You got five times? Yeah. All right, he said that is perfect. You just tell them the truth. I just tell them they had bad excuses. They weren't reading that text right. <laughs> so, no, the reason why, that's actually two things. But one, you read there, it says, and the men looked at one another in amazement. Understandable that they were surprised because they were just lined up in birthright order. How would this stranger know that? That would be surprising if they had to what their ages are. Un like, there's nothing added to it. It's just, of course, they're looking around in shock. Like, oh, whoa, what did this guy just do? On top of that, second part, we have. Benjamin given five times as much as theirs, and that was done as a test to see how would the brothers respond. 
Were they treating Benjamin like they were treating Joseph in the past? So, Joseph tests them by giving them five times as much to see if they're going to complain in Hebrew, not knowing that he doesn't speak. So, not knowing that he speaks the language. So, he wanted to see if they were going to be happy or upset, and they were happy. They ate and drank and were merry with them. So, they're passing this test. They're showing that they truly have changed, that they've grown up, that they aren't the same people that they used to be. They're not the same harboring the same resentment towards Joseph and towards Jacob as they had in the past. So they were already getting evidence that Joseph is preparing for himself one more test still to see how the brothers are going to respond. So any questions for this one? Yes. Was Joseph eating by himself because of his position or because he was eager? Uh, no, Joseph wasn't eating by himself. He was seated by himself. Yeah, I think I think it would be more so he's seeing with the Egyptians. And I think he had become a de- like a default Egyptian by marriage and stuff like that. I don't know. I, I think there was a little bit more of a blending in on that one than it was in the past when he was just a Hebrew slave. He had got like the dog married into the culture and all that. And so he eat with the other people. Could be wrong, but that's the way I, I took it and read it. So he was eating there with his other people, and then the Hebrews were eating by themselves. So. Yeah, verse 32, I think, makes it pretty clear, though, that the Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews because it was detestable. Yes. Over them. Yeah. So he would, he would be violating that statute, so to speak, that. Silver or gold from your, your born's house. 
Whichever of your servants is found with it shall die, and we also will be my Lord's servants. He said, Let it be as you say. He who is found with it shall be my servant, and the rest of you shall be innocent. Then each man quickly lowered his sack to the ground, and each man opened his sack. And he searched, beginning with the eldest and ending with the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they tore their clothes, and every man loaded his donkey, and they returned to the city. So, pause it right there. Joseph, again, fills his sacks with food, puts money in his sacks. Uh, interesting thing about the divination, so just a little bit of insight into that practice. So the type being referred to here is cup divination. Um, and in this one, it could have taken several different forms of cup divination. We'll get into a little bit more, but sometimes they would pour clear water into a bowl or a cup and then like within the stream water, they would put some particles of gold or silver and then divine from there, or even some precious stones at times. Other times they would pour oil into the water, um, and then other times they would observe by seeing the light and how it was reflecting into the water, the light rays that broke upon the surface. Um, and so usually then the resulting design that they would see, the gold, the, the oil, the rays of light, would all be kind of figured out and would be able to predict, would be able to divine information from there. That's the practice. Now the question was, was Joseph really doing it or not? And that was a little bit ambiguous, because we do know later on in Leviticus that divination is an abomination to the Lord. So, should be doing it. Granted, at this time, Joseph, you know, this is before the Levitical laws, so could have been doing it potentially, but also, as we kind of read, there's some clues that indicate that maybe he was just kind of saying this is a fitting into the Egyptian role part of things rather than a, this is something that I'm actually doing. And we get that idea because there's, uh, as we go forward, well, as we go forward, we'll make notes of it. So I think that if you read it, you lean towards the idea that he was lying, he wasn't actually doing divination, um, but it said, could be that he was. Yes. The one thing I know, when you read yours, you said uh, in verse 9, <clears throat> and the rest of them become the Lord's servants. And mine says both 9 and 10 say slaves. So it's a little different interpretation of what they're going to become. <laughs> well, I think that, I think, goodness, I think the Hebrew word is servant or slave, or other evidence. And I think that has. It means servant or slave in the Hebrew. I don't think it's so. I think it's one of those words where it can be because it has the same indication. So I'm putting servant here. I'm putting slave down. And that's and that's where that's in our mind. We shouldn't be doing. It should be it should be the same because servant and slave were pretty much the same. Because again, slavery was also a little bit different back then, and servitude was a little bit different back then too. Servants were not paid free people. They were also indentured servants. So, Paul's right there, I talked about clues. Uh, that's a clue. 
because how is he practicing divination without his cup? Because he says this is the cup I use to practice divination. Mm -hmm. Well, kind of an odd way of practicing divination without the cup of divination, but you know, I think that that's just going to get put to the wayside. Just one of those little evidences of where we could maybe take that and maybe where we can leave with it. But we get forward and it says, And Judah said, What shall we say my, to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also in whose hand the cup has been found. But he said, Far be it from me that I should do so. Only the man in whose hand the cup was found shall be my servant. But as for you, go up in peace to your father. So that's the trap. The trap has been set. Question will be whether they step in it or not, because it's, do, do they abandon Benjamin like they easily could, going in peace, or do they try and defend their brother and treat him like a true brother? And here we go. Then Judah went up and to him and said, verse eighteen. Then Judah went up to him and said, "O oh my lord, please let your servant speak a word in my lord's ears." And let not your anger burn against your servant, for you are like Pharaoh himself. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said, My Lord, we have a father, an old man, and a young brother, a child of his old age. His brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him. Then he said to your servants, Bring him down to me, that I may set my eyes on him. We said to my Lord, The boy cannot leave his father. For if he should leave his father, his father would die. Then he said to your servants, Unless you, the youngest brother, comes down with you, you shall not see my face again. When we went back to your servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And when our father said, Go again, buy us a little food, we said, We cannot go down if our youngest brother, uh, if, if our youngest brother goes with us, then we will go down. For we cannot see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then your servants, then your servant my father said to us, Do you know that my wife bore me two sons? One left me, and I said, Surely he has been torn to pieces, and I have never seen him since. If you take this one also from me, and harm happens to him, you will bring down my gray hairs and be able to show him. Now therefore, as soon as I come to your servant my father, and the boy is not with us, then, as his life is bound up with the boy's life, as soon as he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die, and your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to show. For your servant became a pledge of safety to the boy, to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame for my father all my life. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord. And let the boy go back to his brothers. For how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to, I fear to see the evil that I would find with my father. And he launches into this speech, and it's pretty intense. So, sorry, this is a summary of what happened before. But we'll go forward with the Judas launching into this speech. Um, and what he does is he just really gets in, into lays out the facts that happened, but also lays out his concern and his care for not only Benjamin, but his father, which that was something that was lacking beforehand. Uh, the, the sons of Leah were kind of envious of the sons of Rachel and didn't like their father because of the preferential treatment. We get this indication that there was some strife in the family between the sons of Leah and, the, and, and their father, Jacob. And yet, here we have Judah not only expressing concern for Benjamin, son of Rachel, also for their father, Jacob. So it's this kind of beautiful speech uh, of just really taking responsibility for crimes of the past, but then also saying, listen, I, I can't let you take Benjamin away from my father. I will stay here in his place. So he offers himself as a sacrifice, uh, as a sacrificial difference between 
letting Benjamin go and, and taking his place. So, um, just like I said, one of those great speeches, but you don't really have much to go on besides that. Is there any questions? Or do you want to hear what Joseph responds in verse 45, or chapter 45? Questions, comments? Pretty interesting uh, substitute, Judah. Yeah. Pretty interesting substitute. Yeah, it's an interesting substitute that Judah would be the one stepping forward in this way. What do you mean that? The line of Judah has some incredible substitution that comes from. Yeah, yeah. Well, and then, yeah, you go into the, like, Joseph got, like, God. When Judah mediates with his father and then Joseph, and he shows that he's willing to be enslaved by his brother, he's going to hearken, he's going to prefigure, he's going to make us think about when Jesus also is going to be offering himself on behalf of other. He's going to be the one that ransoms not just the brother, but also all people. So, yeah, you're going to see that coming from Judah. Um, then you're going to see that coming from the line of Judah, much more ultimately completed with Christ. So, yeah. All right, chapter 45, we're cruising today. Chapter 45. So after this epic speech by, uh, by Judah, we have Joseph. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him, and Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it. And the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? For his brothers could not answer him, and they were dismayed in his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. The famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down and do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me. You and your children and your children's children, and your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. There I will provide for you, for there are yet five years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. And now your eyes see. And the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt and of all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And all after that his brothers talked with him. So, understandably, they were terrified as soon as Joseph reveals himself. Um, shocked, dismayed, pretty good way of saying it, because, well, they're afraid that Joseph is going to seek revenge. Understandable. Immediately, he tries to assuage their fears, um, saying that, don't be angry with yourselves. This was God's doing that I was sold and sent before you here. And it's not on you. God sent him in order to preserve life, in order to establish a remnant, and, and so they didn't send him, God sent them, sent Joseph. So it's important for them to hear that so that they know that Joseph somewhat forgives them, they, they believe that to some extent. Now Joseph does forgive them, but they're still a little bit wary, wary, understandably so, like I said. Uh, he had been sold into slavery, but like I said, also, he's now been elevated to the vizier, the, 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 the second in command. Not the worst place to be, not the worst position to be in. So Joseph's uh, slavery, God had meant it all along to work it to good, and that's what Joseph is assuring them. 
I do love the language of establishing a remnant. Um, I don't know, I don't know if I noticed it anywhere, but I do believe it sounds like the first time that establish a remnant is used um, in scripture, and that's important because it's about to, it's going to be kind of moving forward, and this idea of a remnant is just very important in the Hebraic, the Israelite language. Uh, it's always God who will provide for himself a remnant of people that are faithful and things like that. Uh, God is always saving a remnant. Do you have questions, thoughts, comments? Yeah, I, I was reading again verse 8. Mm-hmm. So then it was not you who sent me, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, the Lord of the entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. Yeah. I, the father of God, where's, where did that come from? Yeah, father of Pharaoh is actually just a title. Um, there, it's a position and an authority title. Uh, it's kind of like servant of servants for the Pope. I mean, right? It's just, it just became that. Uh, so the father of Pharaoh would be a trusted advisor because a father is an advisor, that kind of thing. So he's not actually the legitimate father of Pharaoh. That's yeah, no, just because when yeah. you put that, they, they, I think they could have ordered the father. Yeah. In that, in that time and place, the father was the head of everyone. Yeah. The words to go down from there. Yeah. So that's why. I, so the father of Pharaoh, like you said, it's, it's, it's just a title, though. But last week when we looked at the names of the pharaohs that were, um, yeah, you know, this is now a newer, younger pharaoh. Yeah, sure. that's now um, the pharaoh of Egypt is is the Somerset the third. So it's a, it's a uh, yeah, that makes so, sense. So the Joseph is now older than the pharaoh. Yeah, Joseph would be older than the Pharaoh, and that would make sense too to make it more along the lines of a father to Pharaoh. But again, that trusted advisor, that trusted role. So yeah, that makes sense. So um, the land of Goshen is basically the area between the Nile and the Promised Land. Yeah. But in a, in a way, 
you'll, uh, you'll, and, and we'll get more into that as we go forward with what's going to happen. Because this is the Pharaoh who's speaking right now, and the Pharaoh will speak about this. Um, and he will embrace it. Very, he will embrace the Hebrews very happily. Because again, just, cause, just because they couldn't eat together didn't mean that they had to hate the Hebrews. It's just because they weren't allowed to eat together. Um, but that doesn't that does mean to indicate a level of hatred. I know that in our minds it does, but in the cultural time, in the, in the cultural ways of practicing, it didn't really mean. It wasn't, a, it wasn't so much a uh, denigration of an ethnicity. It was just a incompatibility aspect of it. Your culture, our culture, is separate. Not eat, not intermingle, separate. But then that there's still a level of respect, I would say, that could have been going on. But I just think uh, you know Joseph interprets these dreams yes. and saves everybody from famine. He puts them on another level. Yeah. I mean, that interpretation itself is. Yeah, you know, there's he saves everybody. Yeah, for many many years. So he's yeah, no, um, he, he's definitely gonna be honored for that. Well. Mm -hmm. And that's that's yeah. why he is revered in the land, and he is all highly honored in the land uh, because he is he interpreted it correctly. And again, I, I do love the fact that it's uh, God has given these visions that he's interpreted these dreams, and Joseph says that, and Pharaoh says it. He says, who else is more wise than you? Because God is with you. And I love that that's what wisdom is to find out. It's, it's the presence of God. It's that understanding of God rather than, uh, like I said, all the last time. Foolishness is those who don't know God. Wisdom is those who do. Joseph is the wisest man. That's why he's elevated. He's with God, knows God. So. And to me, it, it, this, it illustrates the sovereignty of God. I, I don't know if the time, but I'd like to share something. I'm actually doing a devotion for a group that I'm this next week in Arkansas. We're fishing on the White River. And I looked up the, the story of Reese Howells. Do you know Reese Howells? Anybody? Uh, ultimately, he became, uh, started a Bible college in Wales. But uh, they, he and the students and the faculty at that Bible college were people of incredible prayer. And the, during the beginning of World War II, first of all, uh, you're familiar with the Munich Agreement in 1938 where Hitler was convinced to uh, basically sign an agreement and it held off war for a year. Because if Hitler would have started the war in 1938, Great Britain was totally unprepared. And uh, Reese Howells and his faculty and students prayed, and their prayer was, Lord, bend Hitler. And Hitler's advisors, it was later found out, were desperately opposed to that Munich Agreement. They wanted to start uh, the war. And, and invade Great Britain. Well, the war started a year later, and by that time, Great Britain had the opportunity to mobilize. And of course, the US helped tremendously with the Lend-Lease Act. Then, in, when the war started, uh, in, uh, I'm not sure the exact date, but for uh, Hitler decided to bring Great Britain to its knee, knees. In 1940, when he started the the, uh, the air war to wipe out uh, Great Britain's air force and uh, prepare for in invasion, he was going to invade Great Britain. In September of that year, they were on the verge of victory, the the Nazis. And during all that time. Reese Howells and his faculty and students kept praying. There were about 120 of them. Lord Ben Hitler. The Luftwaffe was on its way to Great Britain, and radar showed that at the, at the time. And all of a sudden, they turned around and went back to Germany. What happened was Hitler was bent, and that's when he, he decided, well, maybe we should hold off and invade Russia. And Russia was an ally. He invaded Russia. 
And of course, probably most of us know what happened there. That turned out to be an incredible disaster. And uh, and then through the war, there he gives many examples. I mean, there are many examples of what those prayer warriors prayed constantly. Lord, bend Hitler. The sovereignty of God in, in World War II, and I, I was fascinated by the things that I learned uh, about how God really engineered Germany's defeat, the Nazis' defeat, because militarily they had no equal in the world at that time. Uh, but again, the power of prayer and how God uh, is sovereign. And uh, I was trying to find a passage that I don't remember where exactly it was. How God preserves the righteous. Uh, it's, Paul says that in Philippians, I believe, right? God preserves the righteous. And of course, it, and the, the King George the sixth will also call the nation to prayer during that air war. And the nation of Great Britain prayed. And to me, what it says is we have to keep praying. Despite, I mean, I, I'm terrified of what's happening in our country. But I, I, I believe in the sovereignty of God. And we have to keep praying. Yeah. So, why don't I share that? Because I'm doing a devotion on that with our youth group. And I'm just looking forward to sharing that with the group. Yeah, no, I mean, and, and you do see God's hand. You have God's divine providence sovereignty over all of it. And that's what Joseph even tells his brothers. Come near to me. I, God sent me here. Right. God sent me here. Doesn't look like it was God. I'm sure it didn't look like it was God when he was there in the, in the pit, when he was in the jail cell. It didn't look like God's hands was God. I mean, he knew God was with him, but it didn't look like it was God's will. All of a sudden, two years go by after he uphold, after he tells the uh, cup there and the maker, Two years go by, still doesn't look like it's God's will, and yet it was all God's plan, God's sovereignty, God's design. And so, yes, even when we don't see it in the middle of it, you can see how it worked through at the end. You see, you always can see. But in hindsight, we, we, we see this. And now, at the time, we're just being, we're, we're being God's, uh, you might say, his workers here on earth. Yeah, no, and it's, it is, it's always very cool, too, when you look back in your lives, because I know I can already do that at my age, and I can already look back and see where God's hand was in certain areas, and where God was leading, and how God led, and, and things in a way that I didn't imagine, didn't think of. Right. And yet, God was working that whole time. When I couldn't see it, I saw it afterwards. So, it's always God is in control. God is in control, and we fool ourselves by thinking that we are, and we try to be, and we never can be successfully. So, well, that's one of Paul's in, the, in Paul's writings. He always goes back and says, "Look at what happened in the beginning, yeah. and now Jesus is because Jesus came to us because all these things that happened in the Old Testament and all these things that happened." Yeah. And he reflects back. He's always going back and going back. So this is. This was always God's plan to be where we are today. Yeah. If you go back and read that, the Old Testament, read the scripture, you're going to see where all points to Jesus and salvation. Yeah, but he's not telling us the future. No. And that's what we all want to know. All right? And that's the problem. Like, he's pointing, that's the thing. Paul points it back to this is how you know God. This is how you know how he's worked. This is how you know that he is working. And this is how you know that he will work. It's because you look and see what he has done. Not only in your life, but also in the lives of the Israelites, the lives of all the people. And so that's where you have your hope, your faith, and your trust. God has not just said, do that, believe in me, trust in me, and gives you no reason for it. He also shows and demonstrates time and time again why he's to be trusted, why he is the one in charge, why he is to have his faith, our faith in him, because, well, he does move in history. That's what Paul points to, how God moves throughout history. So. All right. Let's finish up this chapter. Let's finish chapter 25, uh, 45 real quick. When the report was heard in Pharaoh's house, Joseph's brothers had come. 
It pleased Pharaoh his servants. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, um, Say to your brothers, Do this. Load your beasts and go back to the land of Canaan. And take your father and your households and come to me. And I will give you the best of the land of Egypt. And you shall eat the fat of the land. And you, Joseph, are commanded to say, Do this. Take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives. And bring your father and come. Have no concern for your goods, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. The sons of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them wagons according to the command of Pharaoh, and he gave them provisions for the journey. To each and all of them he gave a change of clothes, but to Benjamin he gave three hundred shekels of silver and five changes of clothes. To his father he sent as follows, ten donkeys loaded with the good things of Egypt. And ten female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and provision for his father on the journey. Then he sent his brothers away, and they departed, and he said to them, Do not quarrel on the way. So they went out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to their father Jacob. And they told him, Joseph is still alive, and he is ruler over all the land of Egypt. And his heart became numb, for he did not believe them. But when they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said to them, and when he carried, saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. And Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. So we have um, that little line, do not quarrel. Uh, originally it struck me as odd. And then I, it makes sense, though, because you find out that Joseph is still alive and still on the way. Quarreling is likely to break out about who deserves to be most guilty for what they did to him. They want to assign blame. This is all your fault. I told you we shouldn't have done this. Look, at this is all because of you. You just couldn't control yourself. And that's and he's saying, don't quarrel. Once more, as a reminder, this has all been God's plan. So that's what the quarrel is. At first I couldn't, I was like, well, was, was he referring to? Him? Okay, that's the, it's about the guilt blaming, the assigning. Because, yeah, it makes sense. It would start quarreling. This is all your fault, that kind of thing. So. No, I, and I think that's, that the testing for that has already been done. So that wasn't going to be another test on that part. Do so not quarrel about the three hundred shekels. All the testing about how the brothers would treat uh, Benjamin has already been tested at this point. That he already had to trust them that they're not going to betray Benjamin. Because who is willing to sacrifice their life offering so much for Benjamin? So he's willing to trust them. The what? They could have. Also, being the father of three sons, I say it all the time too. So it's like, oh, yeah, I can only imagine. Oh, yeah. Just don't quarrel. Just don't quarrel. Yeah, yeah. 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 Another chapter where they talk about quarrel. Yeah. Don't quarrel. Who's the father? Yeah. All right. So. Basically, we have gone through chapter 45. I think it should be good to stop there. Chapter 46, we'll start that up next week. Actually, Pastor Steve will be starting that up. I will not be here. But then, Pastor Steve, I think, will talk about that a little bit. Yeah, we'll do it next week. We'll be here, so that'll be good. So with that, brothers, don't be the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Will do. Hopefully. Should be. Should be a long time. Short. Thank you.